This video will provide an overview of the second notebook, Data Exploration, Wages, for the Tennessee 2021 class. The notebook, entitled 2.data underscore exploration underscore wages dot IPYNB, can be found in the Projects Drive, affectionately known as the P Drive, in the same file path as the first notebook. From inside the TR-TN 2021 folder, open the Notebooks folder, then open the Module 2 folder, and there you will find the appropriate Jupyter Notebook. Book 2, the Wages Notebook, also references a supplemental notebook entitled Supplemental Underscore Employment Underscore Measures dot IPYNB, which can be found by following the file path outlined above and then opening the supplemental file folder. You should copy Notebook 2, the Wages Notebook, and the Supplemental Notebook, Supplemental Employment Measures, to your user drive, the U drive. Open the Wages Notebook from within Jupyter Lab, just as you did with Notebooks 1A and 1B. If you need a refresher on working within the ADRF, you'll see the link to the introductory videos on this slide. Just pause the video if you need to jot down the URL. The outline for the Wages Notebook is as follows. The notebook starts with an introduction that provides a bit of information specific to Tennessee and is immediately followed by an outline of the learning objectives. We know it's tempting to jump into the action items that begin with the notebook setup in Section 3, but take time to consider the content in Sections 1 and 2 so that you step into the data with a greater sense of where you are headed. For Part 3, Notebook Setup, you should be sensing a routine now. We always start by loading the R packages and connecting to the database server. Part 4, considers the complementary nature of SQL and R for data processing, and as you will see, is particularly relevant for what we are doing in this notebook. In Part 5, we're going to link the cohort you created in the first set of notebooks to the Tennessee wage data. In Part 6, we do a bit of exploration to determine how many people are working and how many jobs we're dealing with. In Part 7, we consider a universally interesting aspect of education. How much money do people earn relative to their field of study? At the conclusion of our examination in Part 8, we'll save our results as CSV files for use in Notebook 3, the Data Visualization Notebook. All right, let's get to work. We're in Part 3 of the Notebook. We've loaded our R packages, we've connected Jupyter to the SQL Server, and we're going to retrieve the data cohort that we created in Book 1. And the last thing we'll do in Section 3 is use the head function to look at the first six rows of data in the cohort. This is an opportunity for you to do a quick review of the column headers in the cohort table. And now just a reminder, be sure to read through Part 4 to better understand how the use of SQL and R dovetail with one another to accomplish the tasks completed in this notebook. Part 5 of the notebook gets us into the meat and potatoes. Here, we'll be establishing a link between our cohort data and the UI wage records. In the very first code cell of Part 5, we select for the first five rows from the Tennessee UI wage table. It's important to look through the column headers in the wage table. Once you've carefully reviewed the column headers, you're ready to tackle Checkpoint 1, Time Travel. Checkpoint 1 asks, given the variables in the UI wages and cohort tables, are we able to identify any variables that might be used to define specific time frames, for example, up to three years post-graduation. 
in the two code cells that appear immediately below checkpoint 1, you can also compare column names from the Kentucky Wages Table, and again, from the Tennessee 2015-2016 Grads Table. Okay, we're still in Part 5 of Notebook 2, and we've arrived at the section entitled Data Manipulation. We're getting ready to actually link the cohort with the wage records. Throughout the queries we'll be running, we'll need to consider the passage of time. To do that, we're going to have to create new variables that represent calendar dates. Having calendar dates will make it much more straightforward to use date-specific SQL and R functions to extract employment data across time. In the first code cell under Data Manipulation, we're going to view the first five rows of the Wage Year Quarter column in the Tennessee UI Wage Table. The output will show you exactly what you expect. Data in the form of Year Quarter, or YYYYQ. If we're going to consider the passage of time, in other words, the difference between any two dates, we're going to have to convert year quarter data in the UI wage records to a rough date of employment that we'll call job date. To get job dates, we're going to use the first day of the month of the quarter of employment. For example, if someone was employed at any time in the first quarter of 2005, the corresponding job date would be January 1 of 2005. It's pretty straightforward for you to determine the first day of the first month of any given quarter, but we're going to need a strategy to help our database engine get the job done. Let's take advantage of the fact that the number that corresponds to the first month of any quarter can be determined mathematically by multiplying the number of the quarter by 3 and subtracting 2. Take the fourth quarter, for example. 4 times 3 equals 12, minus 2 equals 10. So the first month of the fourth quarter is the 10th month, which we know is December. Now, let's help our database engine convert some quarters to dates. We're still in the data manipulation section of Part 5 of Notebook 2. We'll find Step 1 through Step 5 that will take our wage year quarter value in the YYYYQ format and convert it to a job date in the year month day format. Be sure to run through the five conversion steps in the notebook. The first step extracts the fifth digit, the quarter digit. The second step converts the extracted quarter number to a month using our quarter times 3 minus 2 formula. Step 3 extracts the first four digits of the year quarter to isolate the year. Step 4 takes our extracted month, inserts day 1, and adds our extracted year and puts everything into the format month slash day slash year. And finally, step 5 converts the date from step 4 into what's called date time format, as year-month-day. After you've run step 5, you'll be able to read a little blurb that explains how this conversion was handled in SQL to generate the dated tables with permanent date columns for Tennessee wages and for our 2015-2016 cohort from Book 1. We're still in Part 5 of Notebook 2, and we find three code cells that precede the section entitled Joining Updated Tables. The first of the three cells is marked Pound, C, Term Award, and Year Award. By looking at Term Award, Term Description, and Year Award from the Grads 1516 Cohort Table, we can see that Term Award 1 corresponds to Fall Graduation. Term Award 3 corresponds to Spring and Term Award 4 corresponds to Summer. In the next cell, we manipulate the Term Award column to create a new column called New Month. 
Here, we convert term award three, or spring, to the fourth month, April. We convert term award one, or fall, to the tenth month, October. And we convert term award four, or summer, to the seventh month, July. Now, notice the similarity between the third cell, marked pound C grad date variable. Here, we use a with clause to generate intermediate month data similar to that in the cell above, but in the third cell, rather than just displaying the new month data, it is intermediate data that is converted into a grad date that appears in our preferred date time format, or year-month-day. And now we are ready to join the updated tables. This is our last code cell in part 5 of book 2 before we get to checkpoint 2. The cell is labeled pound, link wage, and education tables for up to 13 quarters post graduation. This is a particularly important cell. Recall that we've been generating dates to make comparisons of wages relative to graduation dates easier to handle. So now that we've added the job date variable to the UI wage records, we can match wage records, just as an example, for three years post-graduation for every individual in our cohort. But recall, our cohort contains graduates from entire academic years, some graduating in the spring, some in the fall, and some in the summer. So if we want to compare wage records for a specific period of time following graduation, let's say 13 quarters, which would cover our desired three-year time span, we have to consider that we have people graduating in different years and different quarters. We have to look to the dates we've been generating to make the desired time comparisons. What we need is a time that is reflected by a rough job date to graduation date. We can make that happen by using the date add function as designated here in the where statement to separate out 13 quarters past the graduation date, no matter when those in our cohort graduated. And notice that near the end of the code, we are identifying wages as greater than zero, as we want to have evidence that they were employed in that quarter. Notice again before you run the code that we are making our match with the hashed social security number values found in the dated cohort and dated wages table that were already created for us. So why match out to 13 quarters? Why not just 12, which sounds like it would cover the three years in which we are interested? We just want to be certain that we catch full quarter employment right out to the end of the last quarter in which we are interested. Before we actually generate our full quarter employment measure, we can simply filter out the 13th quarter. You won't see this at this point in the notebook, but to generate our full quarter employment measures in the future, we'll filter out the 13th quarter as well as the zeroth quarter after graduation. But again, this is done for future use so that we'll be able to find and isolate full quarter employment. And now you will find yourself at checkpoint two, timekeeping. We are at the end of part five of notebook two, checkpoint two. See if you can manipulate the code to include wages from two years prior to graduation. Part six, quick exploration. Part six presents us with seven quick code cells. In the first cell, we look at the wage data frame to determine the number of distinct individuals and jobs. The number of individuals represents the number who were employed during at least one quarter. Don't panic if it looks like a small number of people. Remember, those in the DF wages data frame are people from our cohort and only for a period representing 13 quarters after graduation. In the next cell, 
we look at the total number of distinct individuals in our cohort. You may want to compare this with the number of individuals you found to be employed for at least one quarter in the cell above. In the third cell, we are trying to determine if it is possible for an individual person based on hashed SSN with the same job based on hashed EIN to appear more than once in the same quarter in the wage data. When you run this cell, if you observe any n values greater than 1, that means that the same hashed SSN, in other words, the same individual, appears more than a single time in the same wage quarter. So the secret is out. We have some duplicate entries for the same individuals in the same job in the same quarter. True duplicates. In the fourth cell of part six, we tackle the duplication problem. At the very least, we notice that when we run this cell, the total number of jobs is somewhat reduced from that in the first cell we ran in section six quick exploration, but certainly not by much. In the next cell, the second to the last cell in section six, we look at the head of the unduplicated wage data frame and we see that the duplicates that appeared earlier prior to deduplication are gone. Again, although we are only looking at the first six rows of data, this is additional confirmation that our deduplication worked. In the very last code cell of part six, quick exploration, we do a simple select to see if we can query our new linked cohort wages table. When you run the cell, did you get a result or did you get an error? We have arrived at part seven. In parts five and six, we've already established that we can connect education data to employment data. Think of part seven as your project field manual. It is absolutely loaded with how to's. As you are working through part seven, You'll likely think of all kinds of questions you might ask the data, but keep your project questions foremost in your mind. What sorts of calculations, conversions, filters, and analyses are demonstrated that would help you capture the data that you could use to answer your research question? Now, let's consider the how-tos we'll look at. We'll look at summary statistics such as average quarterly earnings. We'll isolate the most common majors to see what their wage trends are like. We'll consider dominant earnings. Recall that dominant earnings refers to the highest earning for an individual in a given quarter. We can restrict earnings for an individual with multiple jobs to the job that paid them the highest wage using an approach similar to that which we used to deduplicate wages. And as if that were not enough, we'll look at dominant wages by major. We'll look at full quarter employment as a reflection of stable employment. You'll see how to do that by determining if a person receives wages from the same employer in three consecutive quarters. We'll consider some demographics. We'll explore wages by gender. In checkpoint three, you'll consider stable employment by major. In part seven, we'll also consider Kentucky's UI wage records. You'll find a variable other than hashed social security number that we'll need to use to link individuals in Kentucky to other tables in the Kentucky database. We'll perform a few steps to make it possible to link the Kentucky wage table to the Tennessee cohort we developed in book one. You'll be able to determine, for example, how many people from our Tennessee cohort have been working in Kentucky. We'll examine quarterly wage progression and determine movement of jobs to or from Kentucky. Finally, we'll look at employment patterns. How quickly do graduates find employment? How many spells of non-employment do they experience and for how long? We'll consider how to deal with people who have worked in both states, possibly even during the same quarter. 
at the conclusion of Part 7, you'll generate a table showing the most common employment patterns. For example, you'll be able to determine what proportion of the Tennessee cohort were employed during each of the 12 quarters following graduation. Well, if you've made it to Part 8, you've manipulated data, you've joined tables, you've explored, and you've tinkered with the how-tos. And now you're ready to save your outputs in CSV file format. You'll be able to refer back to these CSV files when you are working in Book 3, the Data Visualization Notebook. Note that the CSV files will be saved to the U drive. Just add your username to the file pathway before saving as instructed at the very end of Notebook 2. Thank you for watching. Be sure to have fun with Notebook 2. And as always, we look forward to seeing you in class.